Right, but not past Sam Bonner. Given straight to Paul Scholes! What about that? What about that? 14 minutes gone. Breakthrough for Manchester United. An unstoppable shot from Paul Scholes. Hey guys, welcome to another classical edition of the Pythagoras Perspective. In today's edition, I'm going to be discussing the Ginger Prince, Paul Scholes. I will start off with a brief tactical analysis of his Manchester United career, and then a more in-depth analysis of his England career by way of comparison. I'll then finish off with a review of his technical strengths and weaknesses. Despite being an avid cricketer, Scholes decided to pursue football professionally. He was not a member of Manchester United's famous Class of 92 squad, one which contained the likes of Beckham, Giggs, Gary Neville, Nicky Butt, but he was part of the 1993 FA Youth Cup winning squad alongside Phil Neville. He eventually broke through into the first team squad in the 1994-95 season where he made 17 appearances and scored 5 goals. Now during this phase of his career, Scholes played as a second striker, but even at this tender age you can see his predatory instincts at number 24 making that Late run into the box, great contact with the head, incredible composure for a midfield player. So he had that in his locker even from a very young age. It would serve Scholes particularly well the following season where United had a striker crisis. Mark Hughes had been controversially sold to Chelsea. Eric Cantona did his crazy kung fu kick and was suspended for two months. And suddenly United were a striker down and they needed someone to partner Andrew Cole. Scholes came to the rescue and scored 14 goals in all competitions as United became the first English team to win the double twice. Such was his form, Newcastle were interested and wanted him in exchange for Shearer. With Cantona back the following season, there needed to be a spot made available for Scholes and fortuitously Roy Keane got injured, which enabled Scholes to stake a claim in the heart of midfield to the extent that by the time Roy Keane had returned, both of them would form the most formidable midfield duo in the history of British football. While Scholes had proven himself to be a good foil for Keane, he still had a lot to learn. We see him missing that tackle there, so his tackling game was still very much vulnerable at this phase of his career. But there's early signs of his playmaking ability from deeper areas. He comes here into the pivot position, collects the ball of Gary Neville. Instead of forcing the pass as would be customary in that era, he plays it out wide, more of a continental style. Works in tandem with Keane here to pass between the lines. But this is the special bit about Scholes here. He still had that ability to get into that box at this phase of his career. Um, once again, the build-up play has gone through Ryan Giggs here. And we see this late run from Scholes, a ferocious shot by a midfielder. He keeps going into the box. He should have scored there. But as we can see, he almost had a free license just to attack when he wanted. And this was a very cavalier approach, which was typical of Manchester United in the 90s. Despite Scholes and Keane winning the Champions League together, albeit with the help of the likes of Nicky Butt, there wasn't much control of the midfield in the big games. The early deep-lying version of Scholes was too box-to-box to, box to control the flow of games against the very best midfields, and usually they were outnumbered 3-2. to two. The arrival of Juan Sebastian Varon was meant to solve these issues, but Scholes took offence to the fact that Fergie didn't trust his ability to control the midfield at the upper echelon of European football. Despite that, his goal numbers went through the roof when he was returned back to that original support striker, second striker position that he had enjoyed early on in his career. Now we're just going to take a look at some clips of Scholes during this phase of his career. Now as we can see from this footage, Varane is the deep-lying playmaker now of the team. He's the one calling the shots, making the plays. Whereas Scholes, I mean we'll see this play here, Varane gets the ball, passes between the lines. Scholes has to be very quick and efficient with his movements and in his possession and focus on getting forward. Look at that run he's making. So he doesn't really have that same time to be leisurely with the ball anymore. Varon taking this role is expected to do all the deep lying, raking balls, the quarterback role, but he doesn't quite have that same composure he did when he was in Italian football. Scholes at frustration would sometimes drop deep and try and play make as well, but generally it was Varon responsible for it, and they would sometimes both take turns in bombing forward. 
We now enter the final phase of Paul Scholes' career when he played as the Regista in the post-2006 revitalised Manchester United team. Now, as we can see from this graphic, his pitch coverage is a lot more limited. He just stays near the centre circle and spreads play using his long-range passing. We'll just watch some clips here. This was when his long-range passing was at its peak, but also his control of the game. He's moving the ball around like you'd expect of a Javi or a Perlo. He's using his dribbling more effectively. And now he makes passes between the lines, but then he holds his position rather than bombs forward himself and connects play. Again, using his passing to inject tempo into the game. We now move on to Paul Scholes' England career. Now, he came in controversially as the replacement for Paul Gascoigne in the 1998 World Cup team. Now, personally, I thought it was too early into Scholes' career to give him that much responsibility. He didn't have the aura and the charisma of Gascoigne. And he just didn't have the experience either. Now, we pick it up here. Scholes is the most forward member of a three-man midfield in a 3-5-2 setup. Now, he has some nice moments. He gets that header in to set Owen on his way to win a penalty for England. But other than that, he didn't really have any influence on the game. His passing was quite wayward, as we see here. He was a bit nervous. The occasion simply was too big for him. Beckham had to drop into midfield to help out with Ince to give the team some balance, which then enabled Scholes to have the freedom to really focus on the attacking side of his game, but he just didn't show anything. He didn't show for the ball enough, and England resorted to long balls in order to connect with their centre forwards. Now, compare that to Gaza's influence in Euro 96. He was on a completely different level to a young Paul Scholes. He was at the heart of everything good that England did. His heading, his touch, his link-up play, his skill, his flair. He was a man who was very much in his prime, really, in Euro 96, despite physically not being at his best. So whilst he would have been two years older in France 98, he still would have been a better choice for me than a young Paul Scholes. By Euro 2000, Paul Scholes had become a key member of England's midfield. He was given a free role to just roam around in midfield, be the team's primary playmaker and a key source of goals. But England didn't really play with any width and he was given too much tactical freedom. It was tactical anarchy. Now, Paul Ince had lost his legs, yet he was expected to protect that defence on his own single-handedly and cover that entire zone in midfield. And whilst Paul Scholes was able to get forward and score goals even in Euro 2000, this wonderful goal against Portugal here, it highlighted his deficiencies. Now, his register playmaking was developing. He was able to control attacking play to a degree, but look how high he's pressing up the pitch here from a defensive perspective. He's out of the picture here and Ince is facing a 3v1 in central areas. Portugal had clocked onto the fact that Scholes kept vacating his position. And when he does get back, he's been given the runaround. Getting megged here by Rui Costa. His reading of the game from a defensive perspective just isn't good enough tactically at this level. And Portugal ended up exploiting it with Figo's goal here. Look at this. Scholes is out of the picture. Ince is out of the picture. It's simply not good enough. It's acres of space for Figo to run into and smash it into the back of the net. By 2002, England were under new leadership again. It was Sven Joran Eriksson. And there was no longer the tactical anarchy that we had seen under Keegan. Scholes was expected to play a slightly more disciplined role. He was the more attacking midfielder in a two-man midfield yet again. but Ince had gone and the younger Gerard was there now to do most of the donkey work in midfield. And Scholes wasn't allowed to get forward as much as he had done under Sven. Now, one of the issues was that David Beckham grew in influence uh, during his time under Sven and gradually moved more and more towards the centre, stripping the team of width. And Scholes' favourite thing is to switch the play and he wasn't really able to do that with Beckham being too close to him. For that switch pass but there was no doubt that Scholes's playmaking had gone up a level under Sven's management. He was more composed on the ball, he was less likely to run with it, he preferred to do, let his passing do the talking and just his general ball winning and defensive discipline had improved as well. Two years seemed to make a massive difference, perhaps he was motivated by what was happening at club level and he wanted to prove to everyone that he can function as a elite level register and his play here is just brilliant the way he anticipated that 
won the ball and then he's calmly looking for his passing option and then getting the ball away. Uh, just linking up play so well. Finally, Beckham pulls out wide here and enables Skull to do his trademark long pass. And the game was just easy for him at this stage of his career. This is the Paul Scholes which we all expected and wanted to see at international level. Which then brings us to the final chapter of Paul Scholes' international career, Euro 2004. Now Sven was faced with a multitude of midfield options with Frank Lampard, the rising star at Chelsea, Steven Gerrard's star continuing to shine at Liverpool, David Beckham continuing inwards and becoming more and more of a central midfielder rather than a right winger. So Sven was faced with no real choice but to put all his best players on the pitch at the same time and use this very narrow formation. He went with skulls out wide because he believed with his dribbling threat he'd be most effective. And with the introduction of Wayne Rooney at number 10, this was actually a positive thing because it gave skulls a fellow playmaker he could link up with, someone who took the burden off him in terms of being the charismatic playmaking central threat of the team. But issues were that Scholes defensively was vulnerable in this position. You see, Robert Perez is not the quickest of wingers, he's leaving him for dead consistently. So Scholes' um, lack of physicality was a problem in this wide position. He did have his moments in terms of playmaking, but in truth, by pushing Scholes out wide, England neglected what could have been the heartbeat of their team. Someone who, in the 2002 World Cup, had proven himself that he could dictate the tempo against the very best teams. Sven would live to regret it. We're now going to conduct a technical analysis of Paul Scholes and focus on his long passing. With regards to the Premier League, the likes of Gerrard, Alonso and Beckham came close. Gerrard shared similar traits in terms of the ability to inject tempo with his long range passes. Jabby Alonso had his consistency. Beckham had an aesthetic quality which probably surpassed even Scholes. But he had a bit of all three and that's what made him the best long range passer in Premier League history. In terms of international comparisons, I think the area from outside the final third, Scholes was the superior long distance passer than Javi. With regards to Perlo, he suffers in those comparisons because for me, Perlo was capable of long range killer passing with either foot. And he was just more prettier to watch in terms of his passing technique. He was flawless. We're now going to move on to Paul Scholes' killer passings. Now, for a man who played as a second striker for large swathes of his career and who had the disguise of pass, the vision, his statistics were quite underwhelming. He only grabbed 55 assists during his Premier League career, compared to 102 for Frank Lampard, 92 for Steven Gerrard, and someone like Javi grabbed 212 assists. The explanation can only be that Scholes wasn't risky enough with his passing in the final third. We're now going to discuss Paul Scholes' finishing. I think he was probably the most natural finisher I've seen for an attacking midfielder from an English perspective. Lampard was also a great finisher, but he seemed to have to work hard at it. He's probably more two-footed than Scholes, but Scholes just had this finesse. Chip keepers, he could just side foot into the bottom corner. I mean, the composure that he shows here is just, it's just incredible. What sets Scholes apart is how many registers can you think of with this level of finishing and the amount of goals he scored? Following on from that point, how many registers do you see with Paul Scholes' aerial prowess? He was more like a Platini or a Zidane or a Zico in the way that he was able to make runs into the box despite being of a diminutive stature. He had the timing and the bravery to put his head where it hurts and always seem to find the back of the net. And he kept that in his game even as he moved into centre of midfield. We now move on to a more contentious topic, Paul Scholes' long range shooting. Now, we know it's special, but how special? I think Perlo had more swerve and different types of uh, finesse with his shot compared to Paul Scholes. But Scholes' volleying was just in a league of its own. I don't think even someone like Gerard came close to it. But focusing in on Gerard, I think he had more power than Scholes. But in terms of who was the cleaner striker of the ball, I'd probably say Skulls edges it. But I'd say Gerard has more variety in that he could score from even 40 yards. He could also curl it with his instep, whereas I don't think Skulls had that in his locker. We're now going to take a look at Paul Skulls' dribbling. Now, his technique was pretty limited. It was a bit more like an Iniesta where there wasn't many fancy tricks involved, but he had great agility, would carry the ball well and penetrate space and the ball stuck very close to his feet. In terms of general press resistance, I'd put him on par with maybe a Javi. I'd say Javi's probably that bit superior in tighter spaces than Skulls. But someone like Perlo, I'd put ahead of both because 
He had wonderful dribbling ability, he had a range of tricks in his locker and incredibly hard to dispossess. But Scholes' dribbling, as much as it was simple, it was very effective. Finally, we move on to what was seen as a big weakness of Paul Scholes' career, his defending. Now, we talked about his international career where it hurt him when he played in the centre of midfield and he regularly got outskilled and outsmarted by tricky number 10s or elite level wingers. But what he did have was tenaciousness. His anticipation grew the more he played in the register role. And he was a ball winner. It's just that his frustration would lead to him making reckless challenges. He didn't really have the patience for defending. And he didn't really have top level defensive reading of the game. In conclusion, Paul Scholes was an enigma. The Ginger Prince was someone who had the talent to be one of the most complete midfield players of all time. The English answer to a Michel Platini. Yet he abhorred the limelight and thus he didn't really want to be the star of the show. Yet on the flip side, he couldn't really handle it when he was asked to play a very supporting role which took him away from being the team's central heartbeat. In many ways, this psychological paradox prevented Scholes from reaching his true potential. And yet he did achieve, in spite of his unorthodox mindset, the ability to secure the respect of many of the greatest players to have played the game. He was the Michael Laudrup of registers, someone who could mix it with the best but didn't quite have the clean-cut resume of a Javi or a Perlo. Guys who, despite being registers, eventually developed and embraced the arrogance to dictate the world's biggest games time and time again and embraced the plaudits which went with it. Anyway guys, hope you enjoyed the video. Please like, share and subscribe and see you guys again next time. Bye.